Good morning. This morning we're going to look at information specific to male genitalia and hernias. Let's begin with a review of the anatomy and physiology. The shaft of the penis is formed by three columns of vascular erectile tissue. The corpus spongiosum containing the urethra and the two corpora cavernosa. The corpora spongiosum forms the bulb of the penis ending in the cone-shaped glands with its extended base or corona. In uncircumcised men, the glands is covered by a loose hood-like fold of skin called the prepuce or the foreskin, where smegma or secretions of the glands may collect. The urethra opens into a vertical slit-like urethral meatus. The testes are ovoid, somewhat rubbery structures, approximately 4.5 centimeters long. The left testy usually lies somewhat lower than the right. The testes produce sperm and testosterone. One important point um, when assessing uh, testicular pain in young to middle-aged men particularly is you'll see testicular torsion more often in the left than the right, and I think this is due to the anatomical location and the fact that it hangs lower. The scrotum is a loose wrinkled pouch divided into two compartments, each containing a single testes. Covering the testes, except posteriorly, is the serous membrane of the tunica vaginalis. One of the posts on the posterior lateral surface of each testes is the softer, comma-shaped epididymis. The epididymis provides a reservoir for storage, maturation, and transport of sperm. The lower GI tract uh, includes the vas deferens, a cord-like structure that begins at the tail of the epididymis. It ascends within the scrotal sac as the spermatic cord and passes through the external inguinal ring on its way to the abdomen and pelvis. Behind the bladder, it is joined by the duct from the seminal vesicle and enters the urethra within the prostate gland. You have an opportunity to look at this in this illustration of exactly what we were talking about. Take a moment to identify these anatomical parts. The groin, um, we look at the basic landmarks of the groin as being the anterior superior iliac spine, the pubic tubercle, and the inguinal ligament. The inguinal canal, which lies above and parallel to the inguinal ligament, forms a tunnel for the vas deferens, and the exterior opening of the tunnel is the external inguinal ring. The internal opening of the canal is the internal inguinal ring. These are very relevant when we're talking about hernias. So when loops of bowel force their way through the weak areas of the inguinal canal, they produce an inguinal hernia. Another potential route for a herniating mass is the femoral canal. Femoral hernias protrude here. And look at this illustration. It shows you the internal and external inguinal rings, and it also shows you the site of um, the femoral canal. So it's really important that uh, we use um, finesse and preparation for taking a sexual history. One way to ease a client or a patient's um, fear or uh, embarrassment is to assure them that we take a sexual history on all patients and that the information is highly personal and we encourage them to answer uh, openly and directly, but we also need to assure them that whatever they say is confidential. The, these are some examples of sexual preference and sexual response questions. Um, you could ask a question such as, how is sexual function for you? Um, you can ask them if there is a problem. Um, 
in a certain phase of the sexual response? Um, have you maintained interest in sex? Uh, that's the desire. Have you? Can you achieve and maintain erection, the arousal? And about how long does intercourse last, orgasm and ejaculation? You know, interestingly enough, um, there are treatments for uh, premature ejaculation, and that's a frequent complaint that can be heard in primary care, and treatments that nurse practitioners can be well-educated and prepared to offer your clients to improve sexual health. You've got to ask direct questions about um, infection. Um, is there any discharge from your penis, dripping, or staining of the underwear? If so, um, how much and what is the color and consistency? Um, have you had any fever, chills, or rash? Are there any sores or growth on your penis? Any pain or swelling in the scrotum? Any history of risk factors for sexually transmitted disease? And it's interesting, um, I know these are increased risk factors listed, but I think um, by virtue of being sexually uh, active, um, that that in itself is uh, enough to elicit these questions. We always um, review and must understand, have a basic understanding of the health promotion and counseling issues involved in male genitalia and um, sexual health. So, of course, they include prevention of STDs, including HIV, and um, testicular self-examination. It is re very reassuring to explain each step of the exam so the patient knows what to expect, and it only takes a few seconds prior to the exam. Um, and occasionally, male patients will have an erection during examination, and if this happens, you should explain that this is a normal response. I actually share that with them before when I'm explaining what I'm going to do, and that does not negate you having to stop your examination unless the male asks you to, um, and just um, I think that we also have to consider that it's uncomfortable for the provider at times, and it's certainly uncomfortable for the male at times to, to have a genitalia exam. A good genital exam may be done with the patient either standing or supine. Uh, certainly, I would prefer standing position because then I can go ahead and do my hernia evaluation. But there are times when men are not able to stand and you have to learn how to do them supine. Uh, but when checking for hernias, uh, the patient should stand and the examiner should sit on a chair or stool. This is just the issue of gravity. Okay, and um, if they're lying very often, um, the hernia might not be evident. Uh, same thing, just as a tip, you can put this in your toolkit. Um, when I order a uh, ultrasound for hernia evaluation, I order it standing. So, in inspection of the penis, you want to include skin inspection around the base and the penis itself, looking for excoriation, lesions, inflammation. You want to look at the foreskin, um, ask the patient to retract it. This is an exam that the patient needs to be, uh, unless unable, uh, active in, and they can help you with the retraction of foreskin, with uh, positioning their penis away when you're examining the scrotum and the testes. So if you do see smegma, um, the whitish material that accumulates under foreskin, um, you can reassure them this is normal, but with normal daily hygiene, this needs to be removed, but it will reaccumulate. Um, when you're inspecting the glands, you want to look for ulcers, scars, nodules, signs of inflammation. Um, and note the location of the urethral meatus, expecting it um, to be central. Um, compress the glands gently between your index finger above the thumb and below to open that meatus and allow for inspection of discharge. There, normally there is none, but you're also uh, assessing for caliber and any stenosis that could be present. If the patient's reported discharge and you're unable to see any, you can ask him to milk the shaft of the penis from its base to the glands 
this maneuver may bring some discharge to the urethral meatus for appropriate examination. And although this technique is still used, um, our juicy chlamydia is um, through your analysis. And um, so often that's not even necessary. But at times it might be, and you might not have that test available. You might be doing a urethral swab. Um, palpate any abnormality of the penis, noting tenderness or induration, and palpate the shaft of the penis, noting any induration. And I, I want to um, really impress with you, you, you can't be soft-handed and you can't be firm-handed. You, you have to be confident, but um, you also have to uh, be concise and um, recognize that you, you can't just softly and um, or too firmly. So there, there's a little, there's skill involved. Um, I want you to palpate for any abnormality, of course, and note any tenderness or induration. So when inspecting the scrotum, testes, epididymis, and spermatic cord, you um, don't want to forget the skin inspection. You want to lift the scrotum to view its posterior surface, but you you again ask that patient to um, move their penis out of the way, either right or left or up. Um, a lot of men like to cover for privacy. That's fine. Scrotal contours, you're looking for swelling lumps and veins, and you want to palpate each testes and the epididymis, noting size, shape, consistency, tenderness, and feel for any nor or any nodules. Epididymis is a soft, nodular, cord-like structure at the back of the testicle, and each spermatic cord um, needs to be palpated. You need to note for nodules or swelling or tenderness. Here's a question that our author has posed so that we would, um, again, be able to differentiate between abnormal and normal. Let's take the time to review that question. So on hernias, you want to sit comfortably in front of the standing patient on your stool. You want to note any areas of bulging or asymmetry. Ask the patient to strain or bear down, making it easier to detect, detect any hernias. That's because it increases abdominal pressure. You might also ask them to turn their head and cough. Tell patient of the inguinal and femoral hernias. In evaluating possible scrotal hernia, if a large scrotal mass is found, ask the patient to lie down. If the mass disappears, it's more than likely a hernia. If the mass remains, listen to the mass with your stethoscope. If bow sounds are heard, it's a hernia. Then shine a strong light from behind the scrotum through the mass, translumination. If a red glow is observed, it's probably not a hernia. It could be a fluid-filled hydrocele or um, something of that nature. So we'll end this um, presentation with uh, the last question, which asks about statements about that are true uh, related to hernias. And again, just trying to reinforce your ability to discriminate between um, normal and abnormal assessment findings. Uh, the author wanted to reiterate that indirect inguinal hernias are the most common form. Femoral hernias are least common, but they're more common in women. Direct inguinal hernias are more common in men over age 40. And indirect inguinal hernias originate above the inguinal ligament near its midpoint. Thank you for your attention.